welcome yet again to one of our plenary sessions. This is day two of the Caribbean Studies Association's 47th conference in our 49th year. I think that's worth a round of applause. It's always interesting when we start these things because we're making sure that we are able to connect it to our theme of transforming our Caribbean. And I'm going to ask most humbly that, I'm gonna use yours, Dr. Chipo, your program that you're writing notes in, I know. <laughs> because there's a couple of, um, again, housekeeping. If, please make sure that your cellular devices are at least on mute because this is being live streamed and videotaped for archival purposes as well. This particular plenary is on sustainable Caribbean economic development, technology, agritourism, and research. And that incorporates just about everything that we do in CSA, right? Because we need to make sure that we deal with agriculture, that we deal with this tourism piece, that we look at the technologies and the different layers of technology, education, research, you see how it all lays in. And there's a particular portion, because how many of us are always looking for funding? I should see double hands go up. Yes, there you go. Because then that area of philanthropy and fund development and how we don't look so needy as much as we start to deal with what I've heard one of our panelists share and really settle in my soul that we don't just survive, but we thrive, right? That we deal with value and worth. Need is a part of it, but the focus is on value and worth. So with that being said, we're gonna have a pretty dynamic plenary. I am always excited to introduce, and you know, sometimes that you want to introduce people in the manner in which they share. We're gonna start with the CEO of the Research and Technology Park here on the University of the Virgin Islands campus, Peter Chapman. So you're seeing the, the body piece, but I would like to just give a little bit of context, right, so that we know who is before us. An accomplished economic and community redevelopment strategist and practitioner, Peter holds over 20 years of executive leadership experience in several U.S. markets. During the course of his career, he has conceptualized and implemented a, a diverse array of award-winning and nationally recognized projects and initiatives. Wow. Promoting inclusive entrepreneurship, global commerce, and the comprehensive revitalization of economically distressed regions. CEO Chapman began his decades-long work in economic development and urban revitalization after a brief stint in investment banking in New York City. Since this time, he has distinguished himself as a visionary, best practices-oriented, and outcomes-driven professional who is particularly adept at navigating some of the most technically and politically complex economic challenges confronting U.S. cities and states as well as international jurisdictions. I want to highlight anyone that's willing to be the CEO of the Research and Technology Park at the University of the Virgin Islands in the Virgin Islands of the United States. Round of applause. Let's welcome CEO Peter Chapman. Did you get it? Did you get my whole joke? Okay. I can imagine. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot going on. Let me uh, first thank uh, Dr. Chen for inviting me to be part of the 47th CSA conference. This is my first, so I'm honored to be here, and we are honored to be a co-sponsor. So, um, and it's good to see you all here today. So, uh, I'm going to go through my presentation uh, as quickly and efficiently as I can. I think we're all you know, we're all time limited. I don't want to be too sloppy, but I do want to touch upon um, some critical things that we do at the RT Park and spend a little bit more time on the sustainable development uh, aspect of, uh, of what we do. So that's, so that's the plan, and then I'm just gonna follow the guidance of the, uh, the facilitators. Um, let me, let me so, sort of set the stage 
uh, before I get into uh, the, the, the meat of the presentation. Um, and this occurred to me uh, after I sent Dr. Chen uh, our, our slide deck, my slide deck. So, you know, we take for granted that everyone knows what the heck it is we're talking about when we talk about sustainable development, right? So in my world, which is comprehensive uh, economic development, we throw that term around. So I want to start by just defining what we mean when we talk at the RT Park, um, uh, when we talk about sustainability or sustainable economic development. So for us, sustainable economic development you know, is about a particular form of economic development that really centers the community, that centers local stakeholders, and seeks to maximize opportunities for them while ensuring that our natural resources and also our public health are not compromised. So that's what we mean when we talk about sustainable economic development. And it also entails harnessing opportunities, market opportunities, because we respect the market, market opportunities that really capitalize on our competitive advantages as they relate to agriculture, as they relate to the ocean economy, also known as uh, marine uh, industries, and also energy, particularly renewable energy. And as you know, uh, the Virgin Islands has been in the national press uh, a lot over the last few years. Uh, as it relates to uh, uh, the oil refinery and the merits of restarting that as an oil refinery. And I know that's a whole other conversation. Um, and so with that said, I'm just going to jump into it. So the RT Park is a, we're a very interesting uh, entity. We're a hybrid entity. We're a public-private partnership uh, that was established a little over 20 years ago through a a joint venture, if you will, involving the private sector, uh, the public sector here, the government of the Virgin Islands, and also the university. Uh, we were established as a mechanism for diversifying and strengthening the economy of the Virgin Islands beyond uh, petrochemical refining, tourism, and, uh, and rum production. And uh, we are an independent affiliate of the University of the Virgin Islands. And so what that means is we, um, we have, uh, we have their name as part of our name. Uh, we occupy space on their, uh, on their campus. We own the building, uh, but we have a, we have a ground lease uh, with the university. Um, and it means that we also partner with them around workforce development and harnessing their talent for the benefit of the tech sector, knowledge-based sectors, and sustainable development and uh, sustainable ag. Uh, uh, sectors. Uh, we are a mission-based uh, entity, so uh, we, um, we, we have to make an impact on the community, but we also have to generate revenue. So the RT Park's operating model is really that of a business, and it's kind of complex, but I just want you to know what sort of animal uh, we are. Um, and I, I'm usually very cynical when it comes to these awards and national designations, but for the heck of it, I should just share with you that the RT Park in the last few years has been designated and considered by the International Economic Development Council as one of the highest performing EDOs in the Americas, not just in the region, but in the uh, Americas. And so, so our our North Star, as we call it, is um, a doctrine uh, called Title 17 of the Virgin Islands Code. And it was really a, was really a visionary uh, piece of work that was, that was conceived by several uh, individuals who were affiliated with the university um, uh, many moons ago. One is Professor William DeLone, who is back on our board. Um, he's a professor emeritus at American University. Uh, 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 Dr. Rimpel, who was a former uh, Price Waterhouse uh, Coopers uh, uh, partner, and they had this vision for really creating a mechanism that would help to 
bring us into the 20th century and eventually 21st century in terms of how we do economic development in the Virgin Islands. So we're really standing on the shoulders of those, those gentlemen. And Title 17 lays out five key areas or five verticals as we, as we call them. So the first is the attraction of new enterprises. Pretty, pretty simple. The second is uh, entrepreneurship support and this primarily relates to startup uh, entities, promising startup uh, uh, entities, and we can certainly dive into that. Talent development. You can't grow a tech ecosystem or any other type of ecosystem without having the right talent. Pretty obvious, right? Facilities development, also known as real estate development or infrastructure. So you can't build a viable economy without having places, without having infrastructure, right? where uh, businesses can operate and where talent can operate and where the community can seek opportunities to live and do and do business and finally access to capital right so capital is one of the most critical elements of startups expansions so forth and so on so those are the five pillars or verticals of the uh, of the RT park we also have the ability to establish affiliate entities, right? So we have at least one affiliate entity that's noteworthy, which is a nonprofit organization. Not going to get into that. And we are proud of the fact that we are 100% self-funded, so we generate revenue, and that's how we support our work. And then we reinvest uh, the money that we earn into economic and community development initiatives that benefit the Virgin Islands. So again, I'm going to just breeze through this. So in the area of business attraction, these are the sectors that we focus, uh, that we focus on. And so in addition to the sort of predictable standard tech-related sectors, we also focus on things like media and creative economy. We have a lot of people in the Virgin Islands diaspora, right, who are, who are artists, who are filmmakers. I see Johanna uh, Bermudez over there. And so we decided last year that this was going to be a sector that we focused on. So we are working to build, for starters, a legitimate film industry here in the Virgin Islands. And then sustainable development is something we're going to talk about more. But those are the sectors that we focus, that we focus on primarily. Uh, entrepreneurship, the work that we do in the entrepreneurship uh, space is largely defined by a program that we call Accelerate Virgin Islands, which is a... Uh, a, an intensive, very competitive technical assistance program designed for promising early stage uh, firms, irrespective of the industry and sectors that they're uh, in. I'm going to show you a slide or two on that one. Talent development, uh, our signature initiative there, is something that we call the Virgin Islands STEM Ta Talent Archive, which was the brainchild of uh, Amina Saleem, our chief of staff, who couldn't be here today, and Sidney Paul, who was another senior staff member, brilliant uh, young Virgin Islander. And it's really a mechanism, it's an online portal for connecting job seekers within the Virgin Islands diaspora, regardless of where they may be. They could be in Europe, Asia, African continent, connects them with entrepreneurs and companies in the Virgin Islands seeking a certain type of talent. Real estate development, I talked about that uh, a minute ago. The RT Park is a real estate developer, and I'm going to show you uh, a project or some images of a project that we hope to break ground on in a few uh, months. And then the fifth uh, vertical is access to capital. So what this means in real time is that the RT Park is a lending institution. Our signature uh, initiative here is what we call the Catalyst Fund. It's a revolving loan fund. We also expect by the end of this year to be uh, what we call a venture capital platform, which, which means that instead of us simply brokering access to equity, companies will be able to come to us, right, to get uh, an equity uh, investment for their, for their startups or for their expansions. Uh, I'm going to skip this and go to this because it's much more exciting. So in the area of supporting early stage firms, um, and this is really the program that really put us on the national and, and uh, you know, really international uh, stage, um, 
we have been able to take several promising early stage firms from where they are to doing very, very well. And so Grind is an illustrative example. This is uh, Thomas uh, Fields. I don't even know if this guy's 30 years old. He came up with a technology um, that some of you may be familiar with because you may have seen him on Shark Tank a couple of years ago. We were able to get him on Shark Tank. Uh, he uh, created a basketball, an automatic basketball rebounding machine. And if you're, if you're sports fans, you know that, you know, you see these uh, at NBA games, you see them at NCAA games, but he made one for the consumer market. And so, uh, one of our senior people, Eric Sonier, who's not here today, Eric has been working with his brother for years. And so we've taken him from ideation to where he is, and he is, uh, he is a very likely unicorn, as we say in our, in our world, which means that he's likely to have uh, a, mil, uh, a billion dollars in valuation for this, for this company. We're very proud of him. Um, this is a startup battle, which, thank you, let's give Thomas a hand. So uh, there is a, uh, a startup battle that takes place in the Virgin Islands now every year. And uh, we were proud that last year, the five finalists were all, all alums of our accelerator program for early stage uh, firms. And so the winners were Boomerang Eats. I don't know if Khalid Salim is in the building, but um, this is our version of DoorDash here in the Virgin Islands. So creative economy, uh, which is largely about first, we're going to start with the film, uh, film industry. It's largely about creating a sustainable film industry in the Virgin Islands. And there are three legs of this stool. So one is uh, production content. The other is workforce development. Um, and really building a workforce that can serve uh, film work, film production uh, activities, and then infrastructure, right? Having places where film-related uh, uh, projects can do, can do the work uh, that we do. And the image in the middle is of a, of a guy by the name of Tim Reed. You may, you may know him if you're in your 40s or 50s, if you watched WKRP in Cincinnati. Yeah. So Tim Reed is uh, now what we call entrepreneur in residence at the RT Park, um, and he is uh, helping us build uh, our film sector, and I'm going to leave it at that. So this is uh, where I want to spend most of my time. Uh, in, in, the, in the real estate development space, uh, we've been working on a project for literally four years and it's called uh, Tech Village. This is, this is a rendering of Tech Village, not a computer-generated uh, image. This is actually what Tech Village will look like at the end of the day. So what I just showed you was the front, first phase. It's right, it's right, right in there. There are some more images. And this is the, the back of the site, and I'll explain in a minute what all this, uh, what all this is about. So Tech Village is a 27-acre mixed-use project that will, uh, that will consist of office space, research and development space uh, for ag tech, agriculture, technology-oriented companies, companies that are creating new innovations in the area of agriculture and using using you know, innovative technologies to do it. And so we will have space that will accommodate those businesses. We will also have uh, housing, new housing on site, roughly some market rate, some affordable or workforce uh, housing. And the idea in the first phase of this project is to create a dense, walkable community that helps to grow businesses in sustainable ag and support people who may work at those sustainable ag businesses, but the housing will be open to everyone uh, in, the, uh, in the community. Uh, we will also have, uh, we say 16 acres, maybe a little bit more than that, it's actually closer to 18 acres of dedicated farmland, and that farmland is gonna be used to support the uh, 
you know, the research-based activities of the companies operating on the site. Um, we also anticipate that there will be a uh, farmer cooperative, right, that is operating on the site, and they will also have an opportunity to use, to use the land that is, that is available uh, on the site. The first phase of the project, which is all we're focusing on right now, is $42 million, and we are going to be financing that with both private resources, both debt and equity, and also with federal uh, disaster recovery money, without getting into all those uh, very interesting details. But these are, uh, these are some uh, perhaps uh, stronger images of, uh, of the renderings, so that you see exactly what the community will look like at the end, at the end of the day. And so this just lays out the critical elements uh, of the project, and I want to highlight the fact that uh, what we are anticipating over a period of time, right? So development and redevelopment takes place over an extended period of time. This is not going to happen immediately, but over a period of time, we are anticipating very significant job creation, right? So permanent jobs as well as construction uh, jobs, and you can see the numbers there. We also have a reference in this deck to the second phase, and we're looking at doing a hotel in the second phase, but I'm not going to get into that because that's a little ways off. What we are laser focused on right now is breaking ground, hopefully, by September on the first phase of this uh, project. So what are the challenges that are addressed by this project? And I want to keep this very positive and informative. I won't be my usual Peter Chapman getting on a, uh, getting on a soapbox. But number one, <laughs> Dr. Chen knows exactly what I'm talking, <laughs> what I'm talking about. Back in high school, that was what you called screaming on you, right? <laughs> When brothers laughed at you like that, they were screaming at you. I say brothers because I went to an all-boys school in New York. Um, so uh, economic dependency on certain industries, right? So I'm not beating up on tourism. I'm not beating up on, uh, what is it, um, you know, rum production. But what we see from promising practices, from best practices around the country, is that around the country and really around the globe, is that communities that do well are communities that invest in economic diversification. They don't put all of their eggs in one or two baskets, right? The other challenge that's addressed by this project is limited housing options. So um, I, I'm, I guess I'm proud to say that what we realized early in our tenure, and the RT Park as it currently exists and is operating is really just five years old, uh, even though we were started on paper uh, over 20 years ago. But what we realized was we, can't, we couldn't wait for anyone else to address the housing issue in the territory. I'm not just talking about affordable housing, I'm talking about housing, period. One of the reasons that housing costs are outrageous is because there's no supply. So that is one of the driving, was one of the driving motivations for us for having a housing component as part of Tech Village. And this is not gonna be our only housing deal. Let me, let me say that. Um, lack of workforce training, what we call demand-driven workforce training in the territory. The Tech Village project, while it's not intended to be a panacea for all ills, it will be a mechanism for training people in sustainable ag and research-based uh, ag. Um, need for diverse uh, job opportunities, you know, same as, same as the workforce challenges, and then investment in agriculture, real investment in agriculture, not giving it lip service, not talking about what we're going to do. 98% of our food product is imported. That's worse than Puerto Rico. And I thought Puerto Rico was challenged. I have plenty of respect for Puerto Rico, right? Panamanians, my family came in through, through Puerto Rico. But 88, 89% of Puerto Rico's food product is imported. And then I got here and I said, damn, almost all of our food is imported. That is awful. And so Tech Village, the initial companies, will be sustainable agriculture companies that are producing products that can be consumed here 
and which can also be exported. Again, that's very detailed. I won't get into that unless you have questions. So best practices. We are big on drawing from best practices when we develop the models that we eventually implement, right? So we are, even though we have a number of people uh, on the team who are very theoretical, theory is nothing without implementation in our world. And we draw from best practices. So this is um, a similar project uh, at UC Davis. So UC Davis is probably one of the leading uh, universities in the United States in the area of sustainable uh, ag. We have also drawn heavily from a, a little model in North Carolina called Research Triangle Park. You've all heard of it. And this is not so much about sustainable ag as it is about looking for that nexus among research, in research based economic development, innovation, and placemaking. And placemaking is about creating places where people want to be, creating places where people want to live, work, play, what, and that is one of the drivers of regional economic growth. And so that's why Research Triangle Park is an important uh, model for us. So uh, university, I'm sorry, not the University of Virginia, uh, Virginia Tech, which is a leader in sustainable ag, they have a comparable project that has also informed the work that we do. Um, we are very global in our orientation, and so you'll, you'll hear me talk about models from around, from around the world, um, including East Asia. So I spent a bunch of time in East Asia before coming uh, to, to the Virgin Islands to live uh, and work. So, uh, so Shenzhen is another place that has informed our work. And regardless of what you may think about the Chinese government, one of the things that you see about economic development planning in China and other parts of East Asia is it, they don't look five years out, they don't look 10 years out, they look 75 years out, they look 100 years out. So if, if you had been to Shenzhen, right, back in the 80s, what you saw was it was a fishing village. It was a small fishing and agriculture village. But through very, very intensive strategic and visionary planning, it is a major, major tech hub, right? Multi-sector, multi-industry uh, tech hub. And it, and it still has a focus on sustainable ag, but also other areas of innovation. So, very important model. Um, couple of other things about the project uh, that we are undertaking. I don't want to lose the opportunity to mention that the RT Park has partners in this. One of which is the Virgin Islands Good Food uh, Coalition. So Summer Sibley Brown, I didn't see her today. I don't know if she's been at the conference. I don't even know if she's in the territory at this point. Um, Summer has factored prominently in helping us uh, educate, inform, and inspire members of the agriculture community. Because the concept that we, that we developed was not immediately embraced, right? It's a new concept, change is hard, and what we were bringing to the table was, it was capital intensive for a site that had not seen any development, had not seen any agriculture in literally 50 years. And so uh, we owe a debt of gratitude to uh, the Good Food uh, Coalition. The other thing I want to highlight, yes, Summer is, uh, is, is, is awesome. She is, she's brilliant. Um, we are going to use part of our earnings from this project to reinvest in farmers, right? To reinvest in innovations, in technical, uh, what we call technical support, that will benefit our farming community and also people studying, studying agriculture at, uh, at the University of the Virgin Islands. So that's consistent with, what our, with part of our mission, um, which is to reinvest in the workforce, particularly via uh, the University of the Virgin Islands. So we now invest, because we've been very successful, we now invest about $3 million, close to $3 million annually 
into the university in addition to the other work that we do in the community. And so we'll continue that in this space. So we are going to establish a fund, at least one fund, that we call the Fund for Agricultural Progress. And that will be one of the very specific ways that this project will benefit farmers, and we've actually already started. Um, I don't need to go into this. I can get to um, the fun stuff, like this, one, this wonderful slide. Just so that you have a sense of what the site looks like now that we're, that we're talking about. So it's, it's used for parking during the ag fair, right? There is no viable uh, farming or economic development taking place on the site, just to give you that context. And uh, these are, again, close-up uh, images of what the buildings will look like. These are the actual architectural render renderings. And so our architect is local. She's been great. Her name is Renee Diadamo. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, we're, a we're, actually, we're actually good. Um, we're good right now. If, if there's a crisis in the next month, few months, I'll let, you, I'll let you know, but for right now, we're good on the first uh, phase. Second phase will be another thing. But yeah, this is what the project will actually look like. This is, you know, this is the, uh, the principal R&D and research uh, building from different angles. Um, you know, I, I like this uh, slide. Uh, I didn't want to make the presentation too long, but I thought that this would be a nice sort of concluding message on the sustainable ag piece, which is Agriculture needs innovation. The challenges of tomorrow cannot be resolved with yesterday's methods. Investment in research and development is more important than ever before in order to make agriculture more efficient and also more sustainable at the same time. And that really captures what we are. So I'm getting the roundup uh, message from everyone. Um, we are engaged in other things. I'm not going to go into detail with them. We have capital intensive projects, uh, other capital intensive projects uh, planned for St. Croix, also for, uh, for St. Thomas, uh, one of which is an innovation district initiative. Uh, very exciting. You'll hear more about that. And uh, that's our wonderful team, or at least most uh, of them. You can't do this work without a bang up team. And that's my presentation for today. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Fantastic. All right. Thank you very much for that, CEO Peter Chapman of the Research and Technology Park here at the University of the Virgin Islands. We're going to keep it moving. And I know you have a lot of questions, so I'm going to ask most humbly that you jot them down, type them in your cellular device. That's on mute, yeah? And we're, <laughs> we're gonna, in light of the content there, I'm going to ask Dara Manifa Cooper to grace us with some commentary. And this was, as I have learned, a couple of things have been shared. Whenever we talk about agriculture, many persons do not see that as a, an integral component of uh, our particular work. Uh, some people don't see agriculture in the context of like social science or, I, don't, I, I haven't figured that out quite, but I'm just saying. And how many of us eat? And definitely around lunchtime, I, I saw that agriculture should have been like at the forefront. Okay, I just need to add some humor. Let's start with Dara Manifa Cooper. I'll keep it professional. From the Virgin Islands of the United States is the communication specialist for the Southern Sari Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program covering the Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, and southeastern United States. Funded by USDA, NIFA, SARE, provides competitive research grants open to farmers, ranchers, researchers, educators, graduate students, government agencies, community groups, nonprofit organizations, NGOs, agribusinesses. 
and agritourism related efforts. Dara Manifa's communications background includes areas related to education, technology, research, and marketing, including agritourism. Let us welcome Dara Manifa Cooper. Thank you. I like this look, might be a premonition. Uh, <laughs> so speaking about sustainability, sustainable, the ability to sustain, right? Sounds like an easy word. Uh, sustenance, someone just mentioned that everybody eats. Not everybody. Some people drink, but even those that drink have to get what they drink from the earth. And we know who provides that for all of us. How do we then support them so that sustainability has its proper place in reality? The three pillars of sustainability for Southern SARE, and as was mentioned, that's Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education, which is the program that I work for, the three pillars are quality of life. She spoke about social sustainability. That's where that goes into. Environmental stewardship. We can't eat if we don't save the earth and preserve it. And economic profitability. You just had a whole presentation about that. So I don't need to go there. But those are our three because many people define sustainability in different ways. Okay? But if the people are not holistically well, social sustainability, they cannot provide the food for all of us. If the earth is not respected, maintained, and preserved, it cannot provide the soil and everything else, the air and the water and everything else for the people who need to be holistically well in order to, right? And then economic profitability. Funding, agribusiness, grants, scholarships, sponsorships, these are all things that many people, many agencies offer, but not all the agriculturalists are aware of them. Southern Sierra is now one that I'm attempting to do my best to move around and share the good word of. So I'm going to jump to my ask, and I'll bring it back at the end, that I need you all to reach out to any of the farmers that you're aware of, any of the agribusiness-related professionals, persons, young people that you are aware of, and help me find them. Because we need to help them using whatever resources are available. There are many resources under the USDA, and not all of them are equitably available. And that is an understatement. But I, I'm proud to say that Southern SARE is a very grassroots-based organization that goes from bottom up, meaning that the farmers and ranchers are our focus and we function based on what their needs are. Okay. Representation is necessary among those institutes, and I mixed institutions and agencies when I said entities amongst those that exist, because if we who are needing are not there on those boards, the inequity will continue. I'm speaking to the choir, I know that. That's why I'm not saying more than that sentence. Research-based SARE publications, like this one, Building a Sustainable Business, a Guide to Developing a Business Plan for Farms and Rural Businesses. If you don't already have these, I need to give them to you because you would be able to make use of these. It's like the Bible. And here's just one more. Many more will be available this evening uh, with the, the event that's happening this evening. And I'll have many more of these to give away because we do not charge for our publications unless you have a certain situation, which I won't go into right now. Uh, but the Farmer's Guide to Business Structures, LLCs, corporations, partnerships, and more. 
just another example of one of our publications. And our publications are research-based. Whether they're these that are created by uh, professionals within educational institutions, nonprofit organizations, wherever, or some of the very farmers themselves that obtain some of our grants, they then take their findings and put them into publications that then are available for everyone else to see. So we have lots of zeros of publications, um, digital stuff, just, just different things that are available. So what we focus on primarily are grants for farmers, for educators, for the list that she mentioned, but we also have sponsorships in terms of activities and events that are related to helping to educate the agriculturalists and those that work with them. So there's, there's a lot that's there to offer. And in terms of representation, there are some opportunities. And there are two available right now on some boards that help us. Because how many times have you submitted a grant and then you realize that who you submitted the grant to, there is no one there that looks like you. That doesn't mean that you won't get the grant, but it does mean that there's probably a lower possibility. I'm being very diplomatic in how I say this, right? So let's go to the other extreme of that. If we are on those councils more, then you know the rest of the equation. So we have two positions that are open to serve on some of the councils that help to make decisions about the grants that are given to the farmers. Two. Deadline June 6th. I have more information, I'll tell you about that later. If you're interested, come at me. Whether you're a producer or you're in agribusiness, those are the two available right now. There are probably other seats that will come up, but other people are filling them. They seem to enjoy being on these boards too, by the way. And another opportunity is serving on these boards. You get not only to make, help make decisions for who will be funded, but you get to learn enough so that once you come off, if you are one of the people that could potentially be funded, you now have seen the inside version. So there, there's more, but I'll leave that there. The VI is the Caribbean. My role, as you heard, I helped the Virgin Islands, the Puerto Rico. I was in Puerto Rico for last, the entire of last week, dealing with an agritourism situation and helping farmers over there um, get funding to do different things on their farms related to agritourism. Same thing can be done right here in the Virgin Islands. There's funding for it. There's funding there, there's funding here, there's funding other places but you got two places at least that you just heard about. The Caribbean, also the VI. The USDA serves the US, not necessarily the Caribbean, unless you happen to be the US in the Caribbean. So both the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico can take advantage of all of these resources if they only knew now there's one communication specialist for the entire Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, and from Virginia down to Florida, over to Texas, up to Oklahoma, back up to Virginia. Just this one. And she's very short. Except if I'm on Zoom when I'm told that I speak very tall. So my ask again as I wrap up is for you all to help me identify who we can help. Because at the end of the day, innovatively, there are things that we can do, ways that we can transform together. But I need your help to help me help the farmers help us. Southern SARE, S-S-A-R-E dot org. Again, I'm Dara Monifa Cooper, our Southern Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Communication Specialist, living in the Virgin Islands. Southern SARE, S-S-A-R-E dot org. SARE is a national organization. I represent the Southern region. We have other regions and we have other communication specialists. There are only four of us for the entire United States. Only four and I'm the one for the South. So Southern SARE, 
S-A-R-E stands for sustainable agriculture. Okay, this side. What's the R for? Research. What's the E for? Got it. I think I did my job. D. Cooper at SARE.org. D. Cooper at SARE.org. And again, these publications and more. I have a box of them in my car. I don't need to leave with any of them because they are heavy. But I also have, oh, I'm going to give you a separate set. They're already on campus for you. Um, and I have PDFs for all of these. So any PDF that you need of them can be emailed to you or I can just, you can just go on the website and download it. So see me later at this or any time during the rest of the week, please pull me aside. I'm sure I'm going to be being pulled aside very ways, but I'm quite pullable and I know how to say no. So I also know how to say, one second, could you write down your name right here and I will get back to you as soon as I'm done being pulled in this direction. But please pull me because we need all the help we can get, right? The more the merrier, that's what you said? the more the merrier. So I want to thank you all for giving me this time. And what is Southern SARE again? What does SARE stand for? And where is 100% of the funding from Southern SARE coming from? USDA. That's not a normal thing that you're used to hearing for black folk, is it? But we're changing that. There are ways to change that. And any way we can be Robin Hood, we're going to do that. So thank you. And as they flip the coin to decide who's going next. Thank you, Dharma. That was awesome. JIT, that was awesome. I just love how we flow. That is why Dr. Chin is going to come up here. And she, JIT is just in time. But you didn't miss me, right? We, it was like we were all in the same room, right? We're all in the same room. No, you stay right here. This way it comes quicker. Yeah, I, I'm really honored to be able to introduce a scholar that has been in the forefront of a lot of the affairs around, I call it C-19. I don't like to give power to disease, right? So I'll just say C-19. But as a, as a scientist, as a researcher, keep going. Because there's a lot of things because she's multi-talented and CSA is about interdisciplinary studies and you can't really get more interdisciplinary than someone that goes from the biological sciences and research then crosses over into social sciences and economic statistical analysis and then shifts over into education and then navigates through linguistical engagement and then starts to do it cultural work. Um, has been really instrumental in some of the affairs around immigrants coming into southern states, et cetera, in the 48 contiguous U.S., and then takes this work to another level to deal with global health challenges and being instrumental on providing some solutions while the world was shut down. So I want to, with that, I'm going to pause there because of time. Because I would have to read like a long, and we want to make sure that we can get to some inquiries, et cetera. But, and I always say my sister queen, Dr. Chipo, but more um, specifically, because she was ready to come here and just chair because of an error inside of the program. But we all know we did our best, right? But to speak of her and some of these letters you know you're gonna to have to explain that because you know i hear things pmp and asq and sSGB i i remember phd and mfa and uh, so being but right but i think that it's um, important to see that term biotechnologist because it speaks to a lot of areas right and she does have her own consultancy. It was when I heard the level of work that she was involved in around helping people navigate through engagement with vaccine research. 
those that were for supporting of vaccines as well as those that did not and the manner in which she was able to bring her skills, talents, and expertise. So with that, I say let's welcome Dr. Chipo Baker, homegrown, want to make sure I highlight that, homegrown, Afame Funa to the lectern. So you see why I say Dr. Chipo, right? Give thanks. I am honored, Oops. thank you Dr. Chen. And to my fellow panelists, I'm really honored to be here, sharing the stage with you. Um, I'm a nerd. I'm a, I, I love my nerdy part. Um, and as Dr. Chinzira shared, um, when, she, when I saw the, 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 my responsibility to be a panelist, you know, of course I did my research and I was prepared. And then my sister said, excuse me. And I said, wait, but I live this so I, I, um, I can share with you. Um, as, as Dr. Chin said, yes, I am homegrown. I'm 100% as you see it as is. I have been, I have been very, very fortunate in my life path to be given opportunities and I made decisions and they panned out awesomely for the collective. I've always thought about nation building because that is the platform that I come from. It's institutionalized in my DNA, nation building. So the focus on technology for today. What drives me? It dr what drives me as a scientist? I love to see, or I really enjoyed research being turned into or facilitated into a technology innovation funnel, okay? And it being applied. I've always said that information is great. We have a university, you can sit in the library all the time, I did. That library down in Christiansted, that was my home. Charlie Chaplin and I fell in love upstairs. But as a result, I was able to grow, okay? And I've realized that technology, I mean, information is great, but applied technology is where it is. So in terms of nation building, and I see all the great works that's happening with the RT Park. And I'm going to, the RT Park is an awesome entity. There's lots of other entities around, but in the Virgin Islands and everywhere in the Caribbean, you know that we have challenges. While we're very close, we have challenges in communication. We have government challenges. Let's not talk about the people resources. Let's stay on the government inter, you know, that level. And with that, it takes a special kind of skill to get anything done. So while working, you know, in, yes, it takes a special kind of skill, so while working in what we call resourced countries, HIV, technologies, we can name it in biotech, I found that my talents, you know, I came and I did my do and I realized where my role was in the, the brain drain and I had a plan and I said, listen, I am taking it back to my people, the ones that I can smell, I can touch, the ones when I fall on the side of the street, they're going to at least stop and look to see if I'm okay. So, um, a part of my work with the International AIDS Organization, um, I was in the Caribbean doing my work, and every time I would look around, I would see everyone with my funding organization, WHO, everyone, Gates, everyone, and I'm saying, but wait, where's the Virgin Islands? Where are you? Puerto Rico comes, but where are you? And so it prompted me, it said, we're not getting any help based on how we position ourselves. How can we develop? How can we nation build? So again, we have housing here. I'm into technology. I am really into the um, looking out for health and using those technologies and helping companies to develop those technologies so that they can commercialize it. So for the past 15 years, 
I consciously shared with my colleagues that my interest would be on developing technologies for rest of world. That's the terminology that we use. Rest of world means everything else other than Canada. Yeah, those, those of us that can, because we can get it. So whether you're looking at molecular diagnostics or you're looking at, let's say, flow cytometry, those complex diagnostics that is needed. Science is science. How you use the information dictates what is. So I urge people, even in education, to embrace the science. We're scientists. Embrace it and utilize that information to develop your nation. So again, nation building in terms of building infrastructure when it comes to biotechnology. Not being afraid of technology, but embracing it. Don't wait for Wakanda to tell you it's okay. Don't wait for someone else to tell you, um, well, um, you need to test your wastewater. No. We, in our education, no matter what, no matter where we are, we have to be inquisitive enough to go out there and own it and use the information and, and come up with technologies that can definitely be sustainable, not just, not just for five years, but for years to come. It is great to have housing, it's great to have a new building, but if there's no plan to sustain it, then, you know, it's wasted in terms of resource. So again, my focus is on research, innovation, and applied technology in those areas. Maternal health. Look at, uh, Dara, you talked about funding resource. We're in, I know there's individuals in here that is not in US based. A lot of my colleagues, they're not here, so we're gonna speak a different language, whether it's Guyana or whomever. We can speak that language. However, we're here in the US. We, we have the ability here in the United States, um, in a unique U.S. territory, to access funds from the NIH, from the CDC, I mean WHO, Emory University. I'm sitting on my desk and I'm seeing all this funding for infrastructure building and there is no one, no one, money is being laid just sitting on the table. I was speaking to Dr. Chinzir, I think, correct me, about wastewater testing, which is another huge thing, not just in agriculture, but understanding the temperament, what is happening in your community. How do you know lead is not in your water? How do you know that pathogens are not in your water? Where is the wastewater testing? And there's funding for that. There's training programs for that. It would be awesome to have these conversations so that we could develop this. Because that's where everything is going. That's where it is. You said the Chinese plan 100 years? When the COVID-19 pandemic hit, we're not getting into politics. I'm a scientist. We plan. We don't react. When the COVID-19 pandemic came into being, this environment that we're living in, the infrastructure, I'm gonna use the United States as an example, because I know my brethren from Jamdong is going to have something different to say. Uh, Michael? <laughs> However, we were not ready. Not at all. We were not ready. But it was an opportunity, because we had the resources in terms of people resources, and we were pulled. The government called and said, hey, I need you. I was one of those that I was at the beach, and I said, listen, I'm at the beach. I, I, I'll call me back later on. I thought it was a joke. And they decided, listen, our infrastructure is non-existent. So within that time, we developed the infrastructure so that we can respond we built that infrastructure, we responded to the need, and we can do it, we, it's, it's done here, right? Everyone got tested, everyone was able to get their diagnostics, but what that, ha what that did was, it allowed us to build infrastructure, so that now we're monitoring, we're moni and we're ready for anything else that pops its head up. Before, we would have to go to Taiwan. We would have to go to China. Do you know most of, most of the diagnostics is made in Asian countries and shipped here and then Procter & Gamble or 
or um, let, let's say Johnson & Johnson, they have it packaged and everything is fine. Most of the time that I'm here, my mind is in Taiwan or somewhere or in some, I'm not really here, I'm somewhere else. We have to develop that. So I'm, I'm, I don't want to run on with that. Again, nation building as it relates to utilizing research, placing it into an innovation, a technology innovation funnel like a shark tank, I've been, we, that's, the, that's the style that we do use with the NIH and CDC. And we do, um, how should I say, deep dives into technology because not everything is worth developing. We're scientists. And we partner with our organizations and promote them so that they are set up for commercial success and sustainability, Dr. Hebel. Okay, so with that being said, I know I'm, I'm coming from a position of someone that is in the trenches, on the ground, in terms of science, and I am not here with Dr. Chatman with all of this money, but again, my message for you is sustainability. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Hmm. I hope you're writing down your questions because we're going to do something very unique here. The next panelist, and I know we could have easily been here another two days just on this, is the, serves as the president. You already ready, come. The president of the St. Croix Foundation for Community Development. I encourage persons to Google that so that you can see the work that has been done by the St. Croix Foundation for community development, specifically under the leadership and guidance of its president, Deanna James. I'm gonna say that again though, <laughs> because I don't think people really understand. Sometimes we don't have foundations. Okay, come back. This woman here has taken a lot of blows to support this community. I need to bring it, I'm going to bring it like that. And to have her be able to come and share the level of, of expertise that she has had around philanthropy and its connection to technology, being in the forefront of supporting the various research data that we've been able to collect through Kids Count and other agencies so that we can actually have measurable outcomes and authentic documentation of what the conditions are for our children in this community, I just want you to get clarity on the face so that we don't get any kind of discord neck. The team she has is awesome. The fact that there has been an outreach for the nonprofit consortium here that has brought together over two dozen organizations here in St. Croix to the point that even the framework that we've established in the NPC has been wished for in other parts of the Virgin Islands, the Caribbean, and the world. I just need for persons to be clear on that. I'm going to let her move on in that one. Let's welcome <laughs> President Diana Diaz. Thank you. So I'm going to try to center the conversation today around people um, and around philanthropy. And its rawest definition is the love of humankind. And I feel there's a little bit of pressure on me because I have one of my mentors and founder of the foundation sitting in the room. And so I hope to make you proud. Um, just to talk a little bit about um, how we got started. We actually were founded um, on the heels of crisis, uh, Hurricane Hugo, um, which obliterated this island. And um, in most healthy communities or healthier communities, philanthropy steps forward and provides some uh, support in ways that government cannot. Uh, the sort of divinely ordered reality of Hugo is that after it hit the Virgin Islands and St. Croix, it hit South Carolina, and that meant that national philanthropy got distracted and meant that uh, as our founders were thinking about how to build a philanthropic institution here in the Virgin Islands, they had to think differently. 
Um, one of the things that I've done uh, in my tenure is to really go back and read some of the initiating uh, documents for the organization to understand how powerful um, the conversations were at the boardroom table around how to build a philanthropic institution with no money. Um, and one of the things that our founders recognized early on, I didn't understand the power of it, was that we talk a lot about small businesses, but, um, and we refer to them as nonprofits, but really they are small businesses. And in communities like ours, our civic organizations are the heart and soul of our community. They're also frontline responders in crisis. And so one of the things that our founders did a little differently in, around their decision making was to actually make the decision around fiscal sponsorship. Um, and, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about that, how powerful uh, a decision that was, because as a philanthropic institution, oftentimes you fund nonprofits, right? But if you have a community where nonprofits are low capacity, don't have the infrastructure necessary to receive a grant, um, what do you do? And what we realize is that you can either you know, give them a grant and feed them for a day or teach them to fish and feed them for longevity. And so over the course of our 32 years, we've served as a fiscal sponsor for 250 local nonprofits and projects throughout the territory. That's not a little thing. That's not a little thing. Um, some of our largest agricultural uh, organizations, Good Food Coalition is actually a sponsored project of the, of the Virgin Islands. Farmers in Action started out under the umbrella of St. Croix Foundation. And so to think that we've had this sustained impact on the social impact uh, sector of our community is really rewarding. And I can say that when I got started, I was um, at the foundation, I've been at the foundation for 20 years. Um, we've done a lot. Um, a lot of our focus was on comprehensive economic development, which was necessary at the time. Um, what I didn't know, and I'll, I'll be really frank, is that uh, I served for 12 years under the leadership of a white man from Maine. Um, and when he decided to step down, I actually decided to submit my letter of resignation. <laughs> because I knew what was ahead of me. I knew the, the difficult course of uh, trying to solicit resources from mostly white donors was going to be a, a really hard task for me. I also didn't know at the time that I would become the first local and black leader of a philanthropic institution in the US Virgin Islands. <laughs> Had I known that I might not be here today, but... <laughs> Um, and so one of the things that I did was to recognize that the comprehensive work that we'd done, we'd done a lot, was not deep enough. And so I made a commitment to really um, plant my leadership roots in some core values. Core values that are really radical for the field of philanthropy, that have left less to do with competition for resources and more to do with collaboration have less to do with unbridled capitalism and more to do with a real belief in enoughness, um, a real deep understanding of my place and a commitment to place keeping and not just place making. Um, we have worked hard over the last seven, eight years of my leadership to really not just talk about equity as a stated aim, but a state of being. Um, and so that the decision making that we do is rooted in our core fundamental belief in equity. I also um, really started thinking about how to move farther together than faster alone. And one of the things that I did um, out of necessity at the time was to actually start pulling nonprofits together. We'd built these incredible relationships over the course of 20-something years at that time. But um, at just right before my, my, my tenure started, um, the oil refinery shuttered and um, the island really depopulated quite significantly along with major donors. And
and of course social needs increased and so I said let's pull everybody together and just begin talking about what does leadership, civic leadership look like when we're actually working together in lockstep with each other. Not knowing that that was yet another divinely ordered decision. We started in August of 2016, we brought about 50 civic leaders together and just started talking about what does civic leadership in the Virgin Isles look like if we're all walking together in a coordinated way. And we had this really, you know, really ambitious agenda that we had to table very quickly because the minute we started talking about money, everything went left. <laughs> Um, and so we did something that philanthropy almost never does and almost never invests in, and that is to give it time. We actually did nothing for an entire year and allowed organizations to just get to know each other. We spent every Friday just going to another nonprofit space to understand who they were and what they were doing. And almost exactly a year after we started, Hurricane Maria hit. Almost exactly a year to the day. And everything about my organization became clear. So my founders had invested in property um, in lieu of an endowment. Um, and they had solarized the properties. They had asked the, the, the government to lay all the uh, utilities underground. And within four days of the hurricane, we had electricity, internet, and phone. And then we had relationships and everyone got word that the foundation was up and running. And for about three months, we had about 30 bodies working out of our office together. There was not one decision that we made alone. We, when we were talking about agriculture, we had Good Food Coalition in the room. We had our long-term recovery group. We had the Caribbean Center for Boys and Girls. We had Lutheran Social Services every single nonprofit in the room making decisions together. And I know that this may seem like this is not about economic development, this is not about small business development, but it is. It is. We had federal funders, we had folks from FEMA who were getting tired of being in their joint field office and they heard that there was this really fun place downtown where there was pizza and coffee every day. And so we had federal funders in there. Our delegate to Congress staff was there. The most powerful experience in my 20 years in philanthropy was to see what happens when people actually physically work together. Not one single investment that we made in that space has not been successful, not one. Every single, whether it was around agriculture or, or energy, every single investment was the single best investments that the foundation made. And it really shifted our perspective of what does holistic community development look like? Whose voices need to be in the room when decisions are being made? And part of the challenge was that for many years we were making decisions in our, in our boardroom. Yes, we did, we, we, we surveyed the community often, but really and truly inviting voices to the table to help make critical decisions was not a, a standard practice. And what I have learned um, through our work, because in addition to all the other supports we've given to our nonprofits that sit in the consortium, we've done a lot of systems thinking work. We've done a, done a lot of systems thinking training. How do you think in systems? How do you think in terms of the intersections of the work of each organization? And one of the things that is now a tenet of the foundation is the belief that relationship is the revolution. That we can no longer program our way out of the problems that we're facing in community. The problems are too complex. And the wisdom that our ancestral place gives us um, is often left out of the equation when we're making decisions. I can tell you that one of the things I've challenged my team to do is to not intellectualize the problems and the solutions to those problems. I often ask them as we're trying to sort through something, close your eyes. What feels right? What feels like the right path? What feels like the right decision? We never get it wrong. We never get it wrong. And so for us, it has been an incredible uh, evolution as an organization, a civic organization. We still don't have a lot of money, but it doesn't matter because I have so many relationships to lean on to do the work. 
And one of the things that I've made it a, pra a, a promise and a commitment to myself was to build uh, relationships outside of the Virgin Islands. And so I have spent a lot of time working with black nation, nation builders and movement builders. Uh, Association of Black Foundation Executives has been my right arm and left leg. They have supported me and connected us to uh, philanthropic institutions that are specifically focusing on black-led and black-serving organizations and spaces. And one of the things that, uh, as I, I reflect on the outcome of our approach to uh, this new approach, a more holistic approach to community development, is the examples that have come out of this new way of working at the foundation. Um, so two projects that we're leading right now. One is, uh, we've, we're closing it out, but came out of that incredibly special time when we were all working together is our Farm Tienda initiative. We were all thinking about the next storm. Like, what do we need to do? How do we need to build? What does sustainable look like or, or feel like for the next storm? And we thought about energy. We thought about food. We thought about workforce development. And so, uh, as a result of all these federal partners being in the room, we got funding for a project that was a solar, uh, solar supported project that would provide solar uh, panels for community centers. We selected two community centers, Caribbean Center for the Boys and Girls, formerly Boys and Girls uh, Center, and our elderly, our only under elderly independent living uh, community center. We got money from the Department of Labor to train 10 young men and one woman um, to become certified solar installers, the first cohort in the territory. They then, thank you, they then went on to solarize those two community centers. And just as we were completing the project, um, we were also launching another project around agriculture, which was these farm container farm stands. I don't know if you've seen them, if you've had an opportunity to tour the island. There are about seven of them that we awarded to farmers that were in the most uh, sort of remote spaces where residents could have access to food and water and they're, con they're considered community hubs. So they are solarized, they have Wi-Fi, they have water buffaloes. Um, and our young people were able to solarize them as well. And as we were just getting ready to sort of close out these two projects, COVID happened. We didn't think that the next storm would be a, a global pandemic, but it was. And every single investment that we made thinking, at the time thinking about a hurricane, was the most divinely ordered investments for a global pandemic. People got to shop without getting out their car at, for fresh food. Our seniors and our youth who were the most vulnerable populations were able to convene in safe space. Um, and the nonprofits that were struggling because donor, uh, donors evaporated during that time had greater capacity because their energy costs were reduced. And so when you think about like the holistic way of people coming together to make decisions, that was our affirmation of approach. The second uh, really awesome project was that uh, we had become court-appointed receivers of a block of properties uh, early on in the organization's inception. And we had slowly worked on uh, restoring some of those properties. One of the largest properties was an old historic movie house. It's one of the, one of the oldest in the ter ter territory, not the oldest. And it had sat in disrepair for many years. We had done a comprehensive community uh, 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 theater study, and our vision was to transform it into a performing arts center. But of course, without the resources, the study had sat on the shelf. And during that very special three months when all of us were together, someone from FEMA was walking down the hall and they said, there's a building behind your building. What is that? And we're like, oh, that's an old dilapidated uh, theater. Um, we, you know, hope at some point to transform it into a performing arts center. And they said, hmm, do you have, are you open to considering dual use of that property? And we said, always, we're always open. And they said, would you consider a disaster shelter? And we were like, yes. Um, they helped us write the grant and we were awarded $12 million for 
a project that will be economically uh, beneficial to the entire territory um, and socially beneficial to our people. And so when I think about like the power of relationships, and I always want to bring back the conversation to people in place, that has been a fundamental sort of like rally and cry for us is always to ask the question, economic development for whom? Um, economic development for whom? I challenge every single one of my partners, my stakeholders, to be very clarified around that. Who are we doing this for? And I, as another lesson, so St. Croix does not have a very rich or healthy tourism product. Um, some may say that's not a bad thing. And one of the lessons about like building from within versus building from without came during COVID. When I would sit in a number of high level meetings with cabinet uh, level folks talking about the crisis in St. Thomas where their entire culinary and restaurant industry was obliterated because the ships started come, stopped coming. Whereas in St. Croix, our restaurant industry flourished because restaurants had been catering to the local community. And so a testimony to doing it differently, to also challenge all of our stakeholders to remember and to reflect upon the fact that best practices and Western models don't always fit in the Caribbean. In fact, I believe that the ancestral wisdom of the people, which is often not tapped when decisions are being made, will ensure sustainability in a way that a strategic plan developed in a boardroom cannot. And so I just want to say to Dr. Chen, I, am, I bow down to you for what you have done. I know the backstory. So I know how you got here and we are committed to making sure that you're going to be held up. And I just want to say thank you for this. Okay, I got it. I got it. Right. I, um, we, we are, <clears throat> you know, these things happen and we have limited time because we do have persons that have to be prepared for other activities. That's the thing about CSA. We do a lot in a short amount of time, right? So we think a five-day conference is long, but there's a lot to be shared, right? Um, I know that there's some burning questions. I would like to at least entertain two. And then I would like to make a, and I know, because ideally we have to prepare for other activities for the evening. I'm going to ask, while you're navigating these questions, we're gonna have an infomercial. Dr. Loriano, you know I've been consistent because this work, these conversations, and I want you to tap into those questions that you have for CEO Peter Chapman, round of applause, please. <laughs> Dr. Chipo, Dara Manitha Cooper, and President Deanna James. Um, I, you ready? Sort of? Yes. Okay, so this gentleman right here is going to, um, and I had to take a minute because this has to do with economic development. We say that we want to see CSA flourish for another 49 years, right? We say we want to have peer-reviewed literature and share our work and see how it can be practical. And what is my favorite phrase? Actionable deliverables. See one right here? We have a CSA journal. An inaugural CSA journal. I know you thought we did this already. No, this is like inaugural. Remember what that word means? Okay. And the editor is quietly standing in the back, Dr. Opal Palmer Disa, for this inaugural issue. And I wanted Dr. Loriano to just share a very brief space 
as we get ready for these questions. Who's going to do the two questions? Let me see the hands. Right. Oh, whoop, that quick. Okay. I got you. I got your hand, Queen Mother. Okay. Y'all really pushing on me. Y'all are pulling. Okay. So I got to ask. Um, the challenge I have is because I have persons that have to be transported into Christian stead. So I'm going to navigate. It's going to be come. Before you come for your question, please share. Yes, just quickly, uh, after almost 50 years, the association finally has its own journal, academic peer-reviewed journal. And um, I had the pleasure to serve as managing editor and uh, direct the traffic. Oh, wow, work. <laughs> yes. We had, a, we had a global team of uh, people from across the five continents that work on the Caribbean, 40 plus authors and artists, 30 plus editors, 30 plus members of the advisory board, and more than 100 peer reviewers. So we are gl very glad that finally it is out. We need your continued support, definitely. So. If you are interested, I hope that you're interested in collaborating in any of those roles. And uh, we have research articles, book reviews, re reviews of arts exhibitions, and uh, scholarly commentaries as, 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 as And actually we have, yeah, articles in five languages, including Papiamento, Dutch, French, Spanish, and English. Not yet, they were talking about it. They, 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 so, um, if, if anyone uh, is willing to, to help us with that sixth language, more than welcome. Um, and yes, so you can, it, it, CSA members will, will be having online access, open access, uh, free access in the, in the coming weeks after the conference um, online. But Dr. Chen wanted to have the printed versions for those that would want to get a copy. Uh, you can go to the secretariat desk and uh, you can uh, make payment through the conference web page. Uh, those that were authors, members of the advisory board, and editors can come to me for, for payment. Um, anything else, Opal, that you wanted to mention? It's so weird. That's why we have a microphone. It's a really important double issue that focus on COVID. And so we have our, all of the articles just about deal with COVID in Guyana, Grenada, Jamaica, wherever. So it's an important issue to get. And as Dr. C said, you know, we're talking about sustainability and um, actionability. And so here we have a journal that you know, this is our 47th conference. I was at a con my first conference was in 82, so I'm really dating my age. But anyway, um, that has come to fruition. So you really want to pick up a hard copy so that we can do the next issue. I like that, to the point. Thank you very much, Dr. Loriano and Dr. Opal Palmer Disa. Sister Queen, you're gonna ask your question? Actually, it's <clears throat> comment in two parts. Uh, when the word sustainability kind of became popular back after Rio, there were many of us who kept saying sustainability without regenerative technology or a regenerative approach is not it. It's like talking about liberation without reparations. So I implore all of you who are dealing with sustainable economic development, sustainable agriculture, sustainable whatever, to put as a footnote, we don't want to sustain what exists. We want to regenerate what was lost. The second footnote has to do with best practice. Best practice is wonderful. I love it. it makes me feel warm and fuzzy. Wind farms are not best practice for an island community. You have to look and, and analyze whether the best practice is actually appropriate. Wind farms do not make sense on a limited land mass. They were pushed by the UNESCO and the industrialists and whatever. So passive solar technology will give you much, much more without movable parts. And so when you talk about best practice, please, Make sure you're ready to meet the people where they are and make sure that that best practice is, in fact, appropriate to the locale. 
Pick one. Thank you. You're going to be my third person. Okay, I'm going over my time because I'm getting ready to. I see the I, when I see the director people doing this, I have to catch myself. And, you know, I was lucky enough. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. C. Um, I'm interested in the agricultural part. I, I have no farming background. I have no knowledge of it. I have a son who was going to, when he graduated from college, I don't know, 17 years ago, was headed to Italy to work on WOOF. Anybody know what that is? No, okay. World Organization of Food or so, something like that. So, you know, some sustainable food thing. He ended up not going because his girlfriend was already there and she got homesick and whatever. So my question is, what kind of agriculture is here now and how do you entice people to build an industry which I don't think is very strong, but I, I could be wrong. And who's going to answer that one? Yeah, I mean, I can speak. Use the mic, please. Sorry, I can speak to an aspect uh, of it. So. That could be an easy question about temperature. Sure. That's, that's okay. No, we, I, I don't. I don't. I don't mind uh, complexity. I just hope it doesn't get me in trouble. So, um, <clears throat> we we have. Um, there are just a handful, maybe two or three uh, commercial farms, right, that are, that are producing uh, goods that can be exported, right? And we can define export in a number of different ways, right? And so, you know, I can't give you uh, granular detail about specific, you know, crops, but they're food-based uh, products. I think we have, it's fair to say, we have a very substantial void in commercial farms that are producing um, critical mass of goods that can be both consumed in, in our region and, and exported. It really, it's really just a handful of commercial farms. The rest of the farming is really subsistence farming. And when I talk about subsistence farming, just to be clear, it's not a value judgment nor criticism, right? But it's, it's the reality of where we are, which is most of the farming is is uh, in support of yields that can support, you know, like families, groups of families, small groups of families, you know, you know, small clusters of familiars, as we as we say. So that's that's pretty much what we have. We don't have I see we don't have gotcha. best practices centered yes, agriculture. I, I want to. But, but I don't want to pause like this. I, I want to. Identify can't do this part because they're looking at me back here, and we've got to we, wrap we it up because offline. right we can wrap it up. But before everybody yeah. goes, I want to make sure that we deal with this. I wasn't supposed to take third question. Right? You're going to be brief. You promise? You promise? You promise? Okay. Hi. Um, I just want to make it very brief. I think that congratulations to all of you all for presenting. I of course, my commitment to the Virgin Islands and to my ancestors is to develop the film industry in the U.S. Virgin Islands, but in the small business aspect is a generation of my hundred family background. But the, re the one thing that with technology, which is extremely important for filming, for everything that we're doing right now, is energy. And we, we confront that on a daily basis within obviously the WAPA. But my second biggest concern, especially because I collaborate a lot with my cousin who is 70 years old and who has 100 centiple cows. And so as a filmmaker, I split my time in helping him when we're in a drought to find grass, to find resources. And so what I would like to present to you all is the technology of the clouds. It is water. How badly we need it in the Caribbean and how badly we need it right now in St. Croix. So we do have a vibrant farming industry, it may not be as commercialized as we would like, but we do have an industry of pride proudful farmers who are working extremely hard and right now they're suffering because they need water. And this is a conversation that we need a larger platform, which Deanna, I would love for you to have. Because right now we have right, right 
has those trees are the farm. So mm -hmm. we're having cows that are dying and farmers whose crop is, is also dying. So that's just for something to include as in technology, thinking about seeing how droughts and climate change is impacting us in the Virgin Islands. Thank you. Thank you. Very and congratulations. I, I, I want to, I have to close this because I have to close this. No, but I have to close this. I have, nope, I have to close this. I don't want to, so let me just focus. I want us to give a round of applause to our presenters who are very patient. I want to encourage persons to have some post um, discussion. I need to remind people there will be a 7.30 and a 9 a.m. I'm gonna say it again, a 7.30 and a 9 a.m. pickup for persons using the shuttles from Christiansted to come to UBI in the morning. Make sure you don't say, I didn't tell you, 7.30 and 9 a.m. shuttles from Christiansted to come on campus for tomorrow morning so that we can actually start on time and that way we can and close to time, right? I want to thank everyone for their participation. I want to extend special thanks to Media One for really leaving and coming back to make sure that this is being recorded and live streamed. And again, welcome to everyone to the day two. We have met with some degree of success and we're off to the author's celebration and other activities happening. Okay, you're really going to really press me, sis. I'm going to work on that in the future. Give thanks. Let's move forward. Woo!